AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the next Kurt Schilling Podcast. Great show today. We got Breitbart's James Dellingpole, our resident expert on climate change, going to talk to me. Well, about a bunch of stuff, but one of the most important, what, what should be one of the most important news items in decades, uh, which is the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA. People have been faking data for decades to try and enforce the climate change, ice age, acid rain, uh, whatever, hoax. They're actually walking away from climate change. It is Their mission statement has changed, and... and we're going to talk about that. One of our legal uh, legal experts, Ken Kukowski, is going to join us later, too, because there, apparently there was uh, some big news yesterday about the Supreme Court that no one's heard about, and we're going to possibly bring that up. Justice Kennedy announced he will be retiring. I didn't think we could see a, a ratchet up in the speed of uh, uh, the frenzy or the eating frenzy that, that is going on, but we did. Hollywood went off some sort of cliff. Uh, they all went off together. And the rest of the liberal world is, is head spinning. The quote I heard yesterday that, that may, it just sickens me, actually, was, was hearing people say, get your abortions now. That's all this is about. But somebody remarked yesterday, look at what's already happened to the Constitution and our rights. And my first response was, what does that mean? What right don't you have today that you had last year, last decade? The overdoing, the over-anxiety, the over I don't know. Uh, they, they, they just have gone berserk. The age-old adage, you made your bed, you got to lay in it, and what goes around comes around, and karma, and all those things were coming to mind yesterday. As I listened to liberals try and explain away the fact that they did the very thing they're trying now to make President Trump not do. And it starts with the guy who was just a walking clown show, in uh, Chuck Schumer. Listen to Chuck Schumer. The Senate should reject on a bipartisan basis any justice who would overturn Roe v. Wade or undermine key health care protections. The Senate should reject anyone who will instinctively side with powerful special interests over the interests of average Americans. Our Republican colleagues in the Senate should follow the rule they set in 2016, not to consider a Supreme Court justice in an election year. There you go. They should. Uh, They're not going to. And and I heard uh, Kamala Harris yesterday say something. We're going to play hardball. And my response is, how can you play hardball when it's not your call? Because the, the majority option, the constitutional option, as it is known, which goes from supermajority of 60 to 51, 49, is in play. It's in play for Supreme Court nominees because of the Republicans' move on that decision after uh, Harry Reid made it a rule of law for every other appointment, legal appointment. And then you have, in a shocking turn of events, you have CNN calling out uh, potential Democratic hypocrisy. Lord knows that's just not possible. But let's listen to Wolf Blitzer as he makes us laugh once again. 
When President Obama was a U.S. Senator, uh, Congresswoman, as you know, back in 2006, he filibustered the nominee, Justice Alito, who is now Justice Samuel Alito, something he now says he regrets. And when Vice President Biden was a U.S. Senator back in 1992, he said President Bush, and I'm, I'm quoting him now, should consider following the practice of the majority of his predecessors and not, and not name a nominee until after the November election is completed. So if it was good for the Democrats then to make these these kinds of statements during an election year in the case of Biden. Why can't the Republicans do that now? Well, let's be clear. It, 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 when Barack Obama was filibustering, he had that opportunity because there was a nominee that was being given a hearing. So, I mean, it, they, they have the perfect right to filibuster, to, you know, to debate it, to do anything they want while letting the process unfold. But to suggest and that they aren't even going to grant courtesy meetings to his nominee, to not have hearings, to not take this nominee through the process, vote them, vote their, the president's nominee down if that's what they choose to do. But you know, they have a, a senior Republican who is clearly in the past that J Judge Garland was well qualified, that he would do what he could to help him you know, get confirmed. Now, now he's backpedaling. This is Senator Hatch. This is blatant brass knuckles politics. And you know what, for, for a party that has a whole bunch of Republicans that say that they are strict constructionists, if you strictly read the con United States Constitution, it is the president's role to nominate a justice for an opening on the Supreme Court and the Senate's role to advise and consent. It is not in the Constitution to do that when they feel like it, to do it when they want to make sure that their, not, their, their presidential uh, candidate is able to appoint one. It's to just do it when there's an opening. Sorry. Uh, that's exactly how it works. The party in power gets to do what they want. We listened to that for eight years. We watched President Obama lead by pen and lead with pen, signing executive order after executive order, which is are now actually being struck down by the very same Supreme Court and other courts around the country as unconstitutional. This is what happens when we dealt with it for eight years. Uh, we had to swallow what we're finding out is the most uh, criminally infested, felon infested administration of our lifetime in Obama. And now we have control of the house and the senate dc even though things still aren't happening the way they should be and i blame republicans as much as any democrats for that sort of stuff lastly listen they ask if president trump is fit to be president yet that a lot of people asking that question voted for this guy listen to bernie sanders on and a couple other people on responding to to Justice Kennedy's retirement announcement. Senator Sanders, Senator Blumenthal calls Kennedy's announcement earth-shaking, gut-wrenching. Uh, or Jeff Tubin says in 18 months, abortion will be illegal in some 20 states. Is this potentially the end of Roe v. Wade? Well, you know, it's ironic. The polling is very clear that the overwhelming majority of the American people support Roe v. Wade. We have differences of opinion on abortion. But the idea of overturning Roe versus Wade would be a, a, a decision that reflects only a small minority of the American people. So I hope very much that the next nominee to the uh, for the Supreme Court does not hold that position. But the bottom line is this is obviously an enormously, enormously important issue. Everything to do with women's rights, having to do with gay rights, having to do with solidifying the pro-corporate anti-worker wing of the uh, Supreme Court. Do you have any confidence that President Trump uh, would appoint somebody to your liking? I mean, it certainly seems that, you know, he, he did publish a list uh, during the campaign of, of potential nominees. Uh, Gorsuch was on that list, and he's indicated this next one will come from that list as well. No, I have no hope that he will appoint anything resembling a moderate uh, or uh, a, a justice uh, who will take both sides into, consider into consideration. I think what we're looking for is the uh, nomination of a right-wing extremist. Uh, I would say this, Anderson. Uh, you may recall that when Merrick Garland's uh, nomination was brought forth uh, by uh, President Obama, uh, Mitch McConnell said, let the American people decide. You shouldn't be considering this important nomination uh, just before an election. And he obstructed it and refused to allow a vote to take place. I would say to Mitch McConnell, remember what you said when Obama was president. Let the American people have a vote in November as to whether or not they want to overturn Roe versus Wade, whether they want to allow discrimination against uh, the gay and lesbian community, uh, whether or not they want uh, votes 
to uh, make life harder for the working people of this country. Remember what you said when Obama was president. And the second point that I would make, Anderson, is that we have some, few, very few, but we have some Republicans here in the Senate who believe that it should be a woman who controls her own body and not the state or federal government. And I hope that they will work with those of us who hold that position uh, in opposition to any nominee who wants to take away that basic right that women should have. First of all, that's a lie. It's not an overwhelming majority. In a recent poll done by the Human Family Research Center, 45% of Americans want the Supreme Court to reconsider Roe v. Wade and return the issue of abortion policy to the states. 49% would like to continue uh, to follow the Roe v. Wade decision. And what the hell, Bernie? What, what was, what's ironic about this? It's ironic? What's ironic? What's funny is, uh, actually, in all this, he was honest about one thing, and that is that there's no chance President Trump appoints a nominee that he's even remotely happy with. President Trump himself. So listen to President Trump talking about replacements for Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy will be uh, retiring, and he is a man that uh, I've known for a long time and a man that I've respected for a long time. He's been a great justice of the Supreme Court. He... Uh, he is uh, a man who is displaying great vision. He's displayed tremendous vision and tremendous heart. And he will be missed, uh, but he will be retiring. And we will begin our search for a new justice of the United States Supreme Court that will begin immediately. And hopefully we're going to pick somebody who will be as outstanding. So. I just want to uh, thank Justice Kennedy for the years of tremendous service. Uh, he's a, uh, a very spectacular man, really a spectacular man. And I know that he will be around, hopefully, for a long time to advise. And, and uh, I believe he's going to be teaching and doing other things. So thank you to Justice Kennedy. Okay. Thank you. Who will you pick to replace him, sir? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, we have, uh, obviously, uh, numerous people. We have a list of 25 people that I actually had during my election. I had to 20, and as you know, I added five uh, a little while ago. Uh, we have a, a very uh, excellent list of great talented, highly educated, highly intelligent, hopefully uh, uh, tremendous people. I think the list is very outstanding. When I was running, I. I put down uh, a list of 20 people because not being a politician, I think people wanted to uh, hear what some of my choices may be, and it was pretty effective. And um, I think you see the kind of quality that we're looking at when you look at that list. Uh, but I, I did add, I added five uh, additional people to the list. So it will be somebody from that list. So we have now boiled it down to about 25 people. So the Supreme Court is going to go from, I, I would almost call it four and a half, four and a half right now, uh, but a, a conservative majority in, in some cases. Justice Kennedy was very much the swing vote on a lot of different things, but he was, he was very conservative, I th in my opinion. Constitution leaning uh, as a justice, very much like in many ways adhering to the Constitution, in my opinion, uh, like Judge Gorsuch. We're going to be at a 5-4, legitimate 5-4 conservative majority. At some point soon, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is going to fall asleep, uh, and God bless her and thank her for her service, probably not wake up since she's 192 years old. I've always been bothered by the fact that this woman is outwardly, blatantly, openly against the Constitution, openly against President Trump, and deserves a seat on the bench as much as I do. But she'll be uh, leaving the Supreme Court at some point. My guess is that we could be looking at a 6-3 Supreme Court uh, in the favor of conservative values and in favor of the Constitution and in favor of the things that this party, this, this country is found on. This is a single voter subject. This is a single, top, single vote subject for liberals. This is all about abortion, period. Nothing else. That much like the March for Life in D.C., the Women's March in D.C. and the Pink Hats was for women's rights. It, it wasn't for women's rights. It was for abortion rights, period. Nothing else. 
women didn't lose or gain or uh, have their rights messed with the day before President Trump was elected any more than they did the day the day after. It's a it's a fallacy. It's a complete fallacy that the left would have you believe. So again, we're going to be joined by James Delingpole, uh and Ken Klukowski, uh, and also I want to talk to you guys. Uh, I recently tweeted out something, and the response that I got was far more than just about anything I've ever tweeted out. There's a thing called the Q, and this thing called the Q is, as I've come to find out, uh, an enormous movement. What appears to be mainly Christians uh, who believe that the deep state is real, uh, who uh, who believe that Q is a group of people that uh, are very close to the president, and they are uh, cryptically releasing information in different places, and it's it's gotten an enormous following. But the left would have you believe the second you hear the word Q, it's, oh, my God, conspiracy theory. And it really honestly isn't. It, in, a, in many ways, it is a group of people who are cryptically leaking information that is playing out in front of us from a position of clear power. Uh, they, they are clearly close to people uh, that know stuff. I, I don't know who they are. I, I don't really care. But uh, it, it's fascinating. And, and again, the left would have you believe you're a nut job if you even talk about it. But I understand why when you listen to what they talk about. So we're going to take a short break. On the flip side of this, we're going to talk about what may be the end of the most, da- quote unquote, the most dangerous threat to mankind's existence in our history. That is climate change with James Delingpole. We'll also get the latest on Tommy Robinson. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about Breitbart News' Second Amendment newsletter, Downrange with A.W.R. Hawkins. Features the top gun stories of the week, every week, and guest columnists like Gun Owners of America's Larry Pratt or Armed American Radio's Mark Walters. Also features a review of a firearm or firearm accessory each week. The newsletter downloads on Thursday, comes right to your email inbox. You can subscribe at Breitbart.com backslash A.W.R. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Welcome back, guys. Uh, joining me now is Breitbart's climate expert, Breitbart's uh, climate change expert, uh, and the hopes that it is James Delingpole. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm well, Kurt. I, I saw people on, on Twitter have been mocking you. Uh, a, few, a few left-wing <laughs> trolls have been saying, you're only a only a baseball player how do you right. possibly know about climate change right and what you should have well, said I, is i asked james dullingpole right well that's one of the reasons and also i can read uh yeah, you, you know read. It's, yeah, it, yeah. it's funny how that whole book stuff makes you smarter um but uh y- y- listen i want to get into this because i think this is incredibly seismic news literally seismic news as it relates to the climate, you wrote an article for uh, uh, Principia Scientific International. And in that article, you talk about the fact that uh, NOAA, which is the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, a group of people we know to have uh, manipulated data, to have lied about adjusting uh, information uh, about the big freeze. They've been scamming everybody along with the rest of that group. They're talking about removing the word climate change from its list of, uh, well, its mission statement, basically. There's a presentation that was given by the Department of Commerce, and in the presentation, which included descriptions of the past and present missions for NOAA, the past mission listed three items, to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts. The present mission, the word climate is gone, to observe, understand, and predict atmospheric and ocean conditions. Have we finally gotten to them, James? I mean, I listen, there's going to be a core group of people that are always going to buy the the world's coming to an end story. Are they finally walking away, realizing that they just can't do this anymore? The first thing I want to say to you, Kurt, is that every American who wakes up every day, the first thing they should do is thank God that Donald Trump is their president. Because <laughs> he is making such good things happen. He is, he is doing so much winning. And I, I, I know... I mean, liberals would, would, progressives would tease me for this, and they'd say that, you know, I was just blowing smoke up, you know, you know and, and trying to suck up to my employers, Breitbart, who are kind of pro-Trump. It's nothing to do with that. I've just been following this, this global warming scam for more of my life than I, I, I think is 
justifiable on any one, one topic. I mean, it's, it, every day is Groundhog Day, as I keep complaining. And it is so good, so good to see things like the EPA being reformed under Scott Pruitt. It is so good to see the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, which has been one of the main institutions pushing the great climate change scam. It, it's so good to see it finally being reined in by this administration. So, I mean, that, by the way, can I correct you on one point? I, I didn't write the article for Principia, whatever they're called. I wrote oh, it for Breitbart. They probably, they probably repeated it on uh, their, their yes, site. Yes, they did. Um, said written by and James Sullivan. I've been Sullivan. writing about, yeah. this, about this on Breitbart for, for, for some time. NOAA is uh, at least the, the belly button of the beast. It's, it, it's, it's pretty, you know, NOAA and NASA... Are, are, are two of the main institutions which have been pushing the lie. And the reason that they're particularly so dangerous and so influential is that these are the institutions that uh, help maintain the records, the data sets used to measure global temperature. And what I've been reporting on before is that NOAA particularly, NOAA has been adjusting the data. It's been, it's been cooking the books, fiddling with the temperature data to make global warming look more extreme than it's actually been. I mean, the, the, you know that, that terrible winter you had recently in, 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 in large parts of the U.S.? NOAA right. adjusted, adjusted the temperatures to make it look like it was just another routine winter. I mean, right. they are, what they do is they adjust early 20th century temperatures downwards and they right. adjust late 20th, well, early 21st century temperatures um, upwards in order, obviously, to make the, the, the graph look steeper, you know, to, to make right. the rate to of the, look steeper. Yeah, they manipulate early century data to make the temperatures today seem far more extreme than they actually are. Yeah, I would call that criminal behavior. I mean, sure. these, th- yeah. these, these, these institutions get your tax dollar in order, I mean, the very least we expect of them, isn't it? The very least is that they're going to be honest. I mean, they can be incompetent. Right. Yeah, that, that's sort of bad, but it's not, it's not as bad as deliberately misleading uh, the public and abusing the science. That's wrong. Again, you're talking about billions, hundreds of billions to potentially trillions of dollars over the last couple decades committed to, well, I mean, you think about things like Solyndra and, and uh, green energy and the scams that have gone on around that. What you, Noah you, you has make a done. very good point there. I mean, it's not just that these guys are abusing science. I mean, they're abusing public money. It's not, that's just the start of it. It's what their lies lead to. They have helped ramp up a scare which enables people in business, all the scamsters involved in the, in the, the, the wind turbine industry. I mean, anyone like involved Al Gore. in... The solar industry. There are so many crooked industries dependent on the lie, on the lie narrative of NASA and NOAA. So, so it, it just it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. This scam. It is. It, well, I call it the green blob or the, or the climate industrial complex. It is huge and it needs right. taking down because these guys well, are crooks. You and I both agree that as mankind, I think we do have a responsibility to take care of Mother Earth. I think when and where we can do things that will, uh, you know, save the rainforest and and keep the Florida Everglades uh, pristine, we, there are things we can do. We should do that. We do the Paris Climate Accord. We were actually one of the leading countries in the world at making adjustments to our uh, our infrastructure before during and after the paris climate accord we didn't need the paris climate accord to to do the right thing but there's the the boogeyman of big big oil and how they're doing things and all the but but the fact of the matter is the two founding bodies the two drivers of climate change noaa and nasa have lied we know people hell james you can point to many people that have left NASA and left NOAA and afterwards said, listen, what we did was a lie. We cheated. They admitted that they had done the things we've said they've done that people called us crazy for. And I think back, James, to the personal cost. And after reading the book Green Tyranny, which, again, I'm going to plug, Rupert Darwall is the author. If you haven't read it, it's one of the greatest books I've ever read. But I think back to the last 30, 40, 50 years, James, how many lives – has this movement intentionally ruined for speaking out against climate change? 
it just goes on and on and on. All the kids who've been brainwashed, all the all the kind of good industries which have been edged out by the by the bad industries. I mean, you you, you think about right. this. You think about all the coal jobs that have been lost because of Obama's war right. on coal. Uh, you think of all the all, all the resources that have been wasted. People's standards of living have been reduced as a result right. of this and, of this scam. And think about this, James. Think about this. You said it earlier. Think about this. There's a billion other things to talk about when, when you talk about this one topic, but think about if Hillary Clinton had won. None of this would have happened. None. If Hillary had won, this is, this is the other reason why Americans should thank God every day that President Trump is their president, because, one, he's Trump, and, and secondly, he's not, he's not Hillary. Hillary, I, I, I maintain that Obama was probably the worst president in American history. Yeah, that's I mean, not even remotely you know, I, I, You're not Wilson really going was, out on the limb there. Yeah, well, Woodrow Wilson was a, a liberal fascist. I mean, <laughs> he, he was, sucked he too, was, yes. He was ghastly. <laughs> FDR, absolutely ghastly. He got lucky, but, you know, got the credit for winning the war, but, I mean, he, he was a scumbag and a, as well. A, a racist I mean, of epic LB, proportions. LBJ, absolutely um, awful. But, I, but, yeah, Obama sort of carried on all their bad work, and I think America... Had had you had you, had you, Trump lost that that presidential election, you would be um, well over basically. I mean right. that's how dramatic the Trump victory right. was. Hey, let me and ask you something. I think that that. that oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, finish, please. People have to realise that the, that the climate industrial com, uh, complex and the swamp are so closely related. They might as well be the same thing. Because well, they are, you know, they create the legislation, they create the corruption, they, it's, it's all intertwined. And, and Trump sees that, and he's dealing with it. I'm so curious when it comes to this stuff. Uh, and I, I generally tend to go, my ADD and ADHD get caught up. When I was looking at that website, I found an article that I thought was absolutely fascinating. Uh, there's a tree in Asia. It's called, I'm going to screw this up, Amygdalus davidiana. One of the things about this tree is that its plant bloom, whenever it blooms, it is widely considered to be an important natural indicator of climate change when observed over the course of decades or centuries. A 2018 study reveals that the flowering plant in Beijing has not bloomed any earlier in recent decades than it did during the 1741 to 1795 time frame. And I, I chuckle when I see that, just like I chuckle when I see the fact that polar bears are supposedly going to be gone, that New York City is going to be underwater. Nothing they ever predicted, nothing they ever told us came true. The, the climate changes, it's called seasons, and that's how it works. If Hawaii hasn't proven to the world that Mother Nature is far beyond strong, or far stronger than anything we could ever do, then nothing will. I want to change the subjects real quick. I'm always fascinated when I look over at your side of the pond, at your parliament, and, and, and how, how politics works in the U.K., and the Whigs and all the, the stuff that they do. I think it's funny. It's good theater. But I watch the, them yell at each other, and I think it's fun and cool. I like to see people disagreeing. Uh, what's happening now? Yesterday, you might have heard that uh, Justice Kennedy has, has said he's going to step down, and yeah. liberals have gone, to say deep end would be putting it mildly, they've gone into the abyss because apparently now they can't get abortion on demand or they believe they're not going to be able to. Well, here's a good one, James. Bernie Sanders said that an overwhelming majority of Americans want to keep abortion as the rule and want Roe v. Wade, when in fact it's not. 45% of Americans would like Roe v. Wade reconsidered to be a state's rights thing against 49%. I don't know about you, but overwhelming majority usually means 90, 80% or more and not 45 or 49 um, yeah, 97% but at least. Does our Supreme Court in any way make the news over there? And if it does, is it does it does it impact you guys in any way from a no, media perspective? It's quite interesting. I mean, you Americans are notorious for taking no interest in in foreign affairs. You know, there was the old joke about I, I can't remember one of the Bushes confusing Iraq with Iran and 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 so on and and. Uh, and uh, to a degree, that criticism can be fairly made of Europe as well, in that I look at the coverage of American affairs in the UK media, and basically the only stories our media will do, and I'm, I'm talking even about conservative newspapers, is isn't President Trump completely crazy? Isn't he awful? So 
you, you cannot find in the UK media any sensible stories written from a, a sympathetic or at least a neutral perspective uh, on, on Trump or on, on what, what's going on, on in America. It, it, it's all as if it's been written by crazed, by crazed progressives. So we haven't really appreciated the, the good news on this side of the pond about what's happening in your Supreme Court. Right. But I know it's a good thing because, yeah. well, I'm interested in American politics, and I also know how much the, the, the judiciary has held your country to, to ransom because hitherto it's been controlled by the left, hasn't it? Well, and, and you saw yesterday as well, or, cu- or a couple days ago, the Supreme Court ruled on the travel ban, uh, ruling exactly how uh, law-abiding citizens thought they would rule, which is the president absolutely has the right to uh, create law in effect to, to protect American lives. And it's stunning to me the levels of stupidity with which the left thinks we possess. And it's, yeah. it's embarrassing and it's maddening to me because the comment I heard most uh, often from liberals after this is, we're no safer today than we were yesterday. No, we are. We absolutely are safer. All right. That there's no debate about the fact that we just enforced a list of countries that President Obama came up with, by the way, uh, in which we're banning travel temporarily so we can get our ducks in a row is exactly what it's not. You know, and the case by which you're you're banned is a very narrow hallway. You know, if you have business or you have family or whatever, you can still travel. But the point being, I think smart Americans are watching what's happening in your country. And across Europe, as the spread of uh, Islam becomes almost uh, flu-like, and the dangers and the and the violence is is not lessening, it's getting worse. And I I got to tell you honestly, James, I don't. Even if Merkel gets ousted, I don't know what happens in, in a positive way with regards to Europe or the UK, because it seems to me well, like uh, yeah, I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you and, one thing, Kurt. Um, Douglas Murray's book. I think has had a huge impact on the public debate. I mean, if you haven't read it, you should look it up. Douglas Murray, um, what is it called? The Strange—I uh, forget—I forget the title. But it's, but it, 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 it's about the, um, the about the, this immigration issue, and okay. I think a lot of people have finally woken up to it. I, uh, I, it's yeah. not going to be easy. Um, right. We're going to have years of trouble ahead, but at least at least people are wise to it now. Right. Right. Hey, listen, uh, I got to go, I, I, but I'm going to already I'm going to set you up for next week. I want to get into Brexit next week with you because I'm hearing some really disturbing things from the uh, globalists about trying to reverse it uh, and going against the will of the people. I'll catch up with you next week about that, but I definitely want to talk to you about that. James, always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Kurt. Take care, buddy. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Censorship is a key issue here, particularly for people on the right. Do you think it was addressed adequately? Definitely not. It was useful to name check Diamond and Silk. It was useful to check even politicians who had campaign ads that were shut down. But in every case, Zuckerberg was allowed to essentially dismiss the case and move on. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Hey guys, welcome back. Joining me now is a, uh, a gentleman I've had the, the honor of meeting, pleasure of having on whatever it takes before. Uh, he is a, a, a one of Breitbart's legal experts. He is Ken Kukowski. Good morning, Ken. How are you doing, buddy? Good Good morning, Kurt. Thanks for having me, brother. It's, a, it's always a pleasure, and, and I know it's really a slow news day, slow news week for you, uh, given... Uh, <laughs> yeah, hey, there's listen, nothing I going ask... on. I guess we have to discuss weather and... <laughs> Hey, listen. I want to. Uh, uh, I want to ask you. I want you to tell me. Uh, we were talking uh, about some things that have happened. Can you bring me up to speed? Apparently, there's been a couple rulings uh, come out that you've been waiting for. That uh, some wins and losses here. I'm curious to know what that is. Well, that, that's right. Uh, the day after each Supreme Court term ends, it starts the first Monday of October. 
and then it ends the last week of June. The day after they get done, they, they release a like a cleanup list of orders right. for all sorts of matters that that were still pending. Uh, and in one of those, the the law firm where I'm involved uh, as a, as a contractor, where I'm senior counsel, First Liberty Institute, had a couple matters uh, pending before the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, and on one of them, the court. Uh, granted review of our case and just gave a short opinion without even taking oral argument or or briefing, ruling in our favor. Uh, Then in a second case, the court unfortunately denied review, and we're, of course, disappointed with that. And then in a third and fourth matter, we actually just filed on Monday of this week two new petitions on religious liberty matters at the U.S. Supreme Court, which the court will now vote in late September whether to take for next year. And what was the win, Ken? What what, what exactly did the win involve? The win was a man, uh, was a woman by the name of Marianne Sauce, and uh, the police came. She's in uh, Kansas here, out in the heartland, and right. uh, police came to her house. Uh, investigating some neighbor's allegation of a noise complaint. And uh, they they entered her house, searched her house during this encounter. You know, the, this woman was, she was nervous. She was, she was scared. Right. I mean, whenever you have police in As your house. As any law abiding evening, citizen is. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a it's a, it's a stressful uh, it's it's a stressful encounter. So she uh, got down on her knees and started to pray, and the officers ordered her to stop praying. And they told her she was not allowed to pray in her own home while she was there. Uh, she uh, she represented herself in federal court. She she sued. She filed a complaint. Then she sued and said she thought her religious liberty rights had been violated. Uh, the district court just dismissed her case, ruled against her. Uh, it went up on appeal. It was at that point that my law firm got involved. We had kind of a, a, a split decision, but basically against us from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. And so we petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court to take the case. And it's been re listed now for a number of weeks, and now we know why. They had decided that they were going to take the case, but that they did not at this stage need more legal briefs or oral argument from us. Instead, they just ruled in our favor, reversed uh, the, the judgment against us below, but have sent the case back down since, of course, this was just right. dismissed at the outset in the lower court where they said, look, right. a person has a First Amendment right to pray. Now, as to exactly what that looks like when you're interacting with the police, I mean, there's what the exact facts were in this case. I mean, right. there's there's a lot of undecided home, questions here. But that's she right. But they home. said, yes, you do have a right to pray. And the lower courts were wrong to say you had no right. So it was a big religious liberty win for a lady who very much deserved it. And now that case right. goes back down, and we will continue to represent her entirely pro bono, entirely free of charge, as we continue to uh, to vindicate her rights. So a, a big win you, for man. religious for liberty there. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, listen, I want to ask you something. One of the things I like to do uh, is get smarter about things. And I like, and a lot of my uh, listeners and, and fans out there uh, are right along with me. I want you to explain to me, when the Supreme Court denies review of a case, what exactly does that mean, and then what happens? Oh, that, those are great questions. And I should say, too, on, on the cases I've talked about with my law firm, our listeners can check out firstliberty.org. They can pull up the court decisions and learn uh, all about these cases and what we're doing on them. When, when the, court, the Supreme Court gets about 7,000, 7, to 8,000 petitions for review each year, those are called, most of them are called petitions for a writ of certiorari. The court's docket is discretionary. Uh, they can, there are very, very few things that they are required to take. If one state sues another. The Supreme Court has to take that case. Also, Congress can build into a law that uh, challenges to the law don't go to just one judge, that they go right to a three-judge trial court panel, and that the losing side has an automatic right of appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. We see that in the voting rights case, or when you're challenging the constitutionality of, uh, of legislative district line drawing. Those matters can go directly to the Supreme Court. But for 90, about 99% of their cases, it's discretionary. It's their choice whether to take it. And, uh, and the court only takes, as I said, they get over 7,000 petitions. They only take 80, less than 80, actually. So they take 70 to 80. It's about 1% that they take. 
And there are different factors that they look for. The number one factor that they look for is whether that what's called there is what is called a circuit split, meaning that the U.S. courts of appeals in more than one circuit have gone in opposite directions on the same question. Yeah, of that law. makes sense. Country, yeah, that's right. The country is divided into 12 geographical circuits, and federal appeals judges are really smart. Most appeals are unanimous. Most of them come out the same way all across the country. And when that's going on, the Supreme Court usually doesn't think they should give one of these coveted spots on their docket because they only have so many hours in the day, right, like the rest right. of us. So in terms of the cases they take, they figure, look, if all the lower courts are all ruling the same way, then sure, we know the loser in the case would like us to take it, but it looks like the law was probably right in those right. lower decisions. It's when they get a circuit split that that's the number one reason for them to decide that they should take on a case. And what it means if they deny review, it is not in any way a reflection on the merits. It does not support the lower court. It does not go against the lower court. That's it exactly what I thought. Involved. I yeah, thought it right. was just basically them saying this is not important enough for us to look at. Well, or, or it might be important, but maybe, maybe there's what's called a vehicle problem with the case. Maybe there's something weird about the facts of it right. where they think it might not lead to uh, to the kind of clean precedent that will benefit the nation. I mean, right. there's all sorts of reasons that they can... De- Maybe they just decided the case just like it six months ago, and they just think that it, it's not... Even if the lower court got it wrong and it might be important, that still they think it needs to keep percolating in the lower courts for a couple of years before they take it back up again. So there's lots of reasons there. But you're right. A certain denial as we call it, has no value as precedent one way or the other, and it doesn't even suggest. It does not suggest that some of the justices didn't want very badly to take it just for whatever reason. It, out of nine justices on the court, it takes four to grant review on a case. You might have had two or three people voting for it. Right. Maybe they were big on it. But for whatever reason, you just didn't get the fourth vote uh, in, a, in, the, in the case uh, where it gets denied. Fascinating. I mean, the, the, I find this whole thing, the, the topic, to be incredibly uh, interesting. And, I, and one of the things uh, off of the uh, Kennedy announcement that I'm uh, that I've come to realize is, and this is an opinion, obviously, but but it feels to me that very much like the left. Uh, this is not they're not up in arms about about Justice Kennedy. They're up in arms about the right to have an abortion. Uh, this feels very much like a one topic uh, argument. And I'm sure there's other things there gay rights and, and other things that they're concerned about, which I see as absolutely nothing. Uh, there's nothing to worry about, but they're going to do this. But let me ask you something. I remember uh, I got very uh, intimate with under, trying to understand how this all works when, when Judge Gorsuch was, uh, was on the docket. And um, one of the things I want to ask someone of a legal mind like you is, is the mission statement, I guess is what I'm looking at for the Supreme Court, is it to follow the letter of the law in the Constitution and enforce that, or is it to interpret the Constitution in a way that, that they believe to be actually what it meant? Uh, Article 3, Section 1 uh, of the uh, Constitution says that the judicial power shall be vested in a Supreme Court of the United States and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time establish. Uh, the, so the question becomes, to the framers of the Constitution in 1789, what did they think the judicial power was all about? And what the framers did, our, our form of government is based, Kurt, on a profound distrust of government. And that's right. why the framers of this country, they took government power and they broke it. They broke it between a federal level and then sovereign states. And then as they kept writing a document about what would be involved at the federal level, they took that part of the power and they broke it again into three parts, legislative, executive, and judicial. They clearly articulated the powers of each. They separated them from each other, and then they gave them checks and balances over each other. And then they also built in a provision later in the document to say, we know that this isn't a perfect document, but we think it's perfectible. Here is the amendment process, and that is how you would change this document, which whatever it does say for as long as it says it in Article 6 says shall be the supreme law of the land. And then, of course, we have amended it you know, 20, 27 times since then uh, in the past 200 years. <clears throat> the role of the courts are to decide – 
uh, is to decide cases and controversies, legal cases and controversies, meaning in our system under the rule of law, the legislative branch makes the law, the executive branch administers the law and enforces the law and all of its right. programs and functions. But whenever uh, citizens, individuals or organizations or companies, whenever persons clash either with each other or with the government, that creates a legal dispute. And then the, that's where the courts come in to determine, is this truly, because not every conflict between people is a matter for a courtroom, but right. that's where courts come in and say, what you're bringing to us, is this truly a case, a legal case or controversy? And if so, we, have, we may have the judicial authority to weigh in on it to decide the legal rights and obligations and consequences for the parties that are before us. So that right. is the judicial function. Now, in terms of how that plays out, and all of that is a foundation, uh, all of that's just the, the, the essential part of the answer to, to the question that you asked. It's on that foundation then that the issue becomes the person who's filing the lawsuit, the plaintiff, what provision of law do they say is violated? Where do they say they've been injured? Where are their rights being violated? Are they saying it's something in the Constitution? Is it something in federal law? Is it a federal regulation? So you have to identify what it is, what law it is that they say is being broken. And then the role of the court is to say, what do the means, what do the words of that law mean? Whether it's the Constitution as the Supreme Law, or whether it's an act of Congress, or whether it's an age, a regulation from a federal agency, or whatever it is. Maybe it's a contract between two private companies that somehow got into federal right. court because there's a lot of money involved, and they're from different states. That, However that nets out, the role of the court is to, is to say, okay, give us the law. You know, we're going to study this. We're going to interpret it. We're going to figure out what these words mean and how those words apply to the facts of your situation. That is the judicial process that leads to a court issuing a judgment in a case for one side versus the other. And that is the role of the U.S. Supreme Court and under it, the inferior courts that Congress has established, the federal district right. courts, which are the trial courts, and the U.S. courts of appeals that we've discussed. I, I got to tell you, as I listen to you explain that, one of the things that just becomes blatantly obvious to me is, is when you look at all of the language inside the Constitution and the uh, desire to disperse power and make sure that uh, no one body ruled all they they were living in a time and a place and under the uh, under the uh, formerly under the rule of a government that gave them every example they could want looking ahead w what the british government was doing to them and how it was doing it to them uh, was laying out a roadmap for what they wanted to make sure never happened again and I, I, I don't think that's a small thing because a lot of people talk about the, the Constitution as a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a centuries-old document. It, it doesn't translate da, 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 when it actually it translates perfectly to today. And, and, and I, 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 I can't help but think that they had an enormous uh, uh, sample size of, of uh, uh, events and, and uh, interactions to know exactly what they wanted to never happen again. And that, I think that's one of the reasons why this country, and, and I use the word perfect, but I'm, I'm, I mean, in, you know, in the context of what it means, our Constitution, in my opinion, after the amendments, is almost perfect in, in the sense f for the freedoms we're afforded. Kurt, you're making fantastic points. You're exactly right, I think, across the board, and then I'll take it one step further, and that is, yes, the framers were reacting See, there's an English Constitution, okay? But the problem right. is it wasn't a written document. The English Constitution comes from Magna Carta from 1215. It came from various famous acts of parliament in the English Bill of Rights of 1688. It came from certain famous royal decrees and the works of John Locke and Montesquieu right. and, and Blackstone. And so and you, you take all these documents and all these historical things, you throw them all into a mixing bowl, you blend it all up. And then the idea was that there were certain principles principles that you could extract from that mixing bowl, and that's what was called the English Constitution. The, fr the founders of this country, they were not rebels. They were not anarchists. They said, look, we have rights 
constitutional rights as Englishmen. You are violating those rights, and so your actions against us are illegal, and we are standing up for our rights. It's because of all that that after the American Revolution, they said, okay, let's never go through that again. Let's write down what the Constitution is. Our Constitution right. is the first written Constitution on planet Earth, but it wasn't just from our English history. All of right. the framers of the Constitution had college degrees. They looked back to Roman history, Greek history. They looked through more than 3,000 years of recorded world history. All of them were they were historians and philosophers. And it's from all that, not just our English history, that they spent months, in fact, a couple years, deciding what form of government can we create that we think not only avoids the pitfalls of what we just got done with in terms of this war with Great Britain, but the lessons that other parts of the world in history that we've been taught, right. that we can try and head off those problems before they occur as well. So that's exactly right. It was yeah. the first time in world history that a group of very smart people got together to say, let's figure out what has been good and not good about government in the past, and let's try and design a form of government that we think manifests all of these lessons from thousands of years of history. Yeah, don't reinvent the wheel, basically. I mean, uh, yeah, that, and, that's and exactly right. That's exactly right. They say, look, and, and, there, there have been hundreds of wheels across the centuries. Let's take the best features from all the different types of wheels and, and try and refine our own model right. of a wheel. Well, it, it's amazing, and, and i, I got to wrap it up. But, but the amazing part is they had the Revolutionary War to go from, and basically it looks to me like they reverse engineered. They basically said, okay, this is the war that just happened. How do we make sure this war never happens again? And, yep, and, yep. and 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 I, I I just find it to be fat. And I got to tell you, Ken, I'm really uh, frustrated at the fact that the younger generation is not being taught uh, these the, all of the things that led to the Constitution. And no and question, the, the, we are failing our children yes, if we don't yes. teach them the, this yeah. essential American constitutional history. And you're right; every provision in the Bill of Rights of the First Eight Amendments, each of those did come from specific abuses that happened yeah. between the American colonists and England. That's where we get the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment. I, I, All of those can be traced to specific abuses in the 1700s. I'm going to have you back, Ken, because one. Of the, and I, I apologize for for rushing out, but I'm going to have you back. I want to talk to you next time about. Uh, I always ask, why did we have to have the civil rights movement of the 1960s? Weren't the amendments put in the Constitution after the Civil War that legally allowed everybody to be treated equally? Why did it take 100 years for the for people to start following the letter of the law? And I, oh, I think I'm that's very happy to discuss that because yeah. you're right. There yep. are important answers to those questions, yep. and those are important questions. Hey, Ken, buddy, thank you. Good luck. God bless. Thanks I'm so glad much. you're. I'm glad you're. 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 Uh, you're getting a little news now, and you're going to stay busy. So we'll catch <laughs> up again. So much, Kurt. God bless you. All right, Ken. Take care, buddy. I usually do winners and losers here, but uh, I want to tell you quickly about something that's happened to me. I tweeted out earlier uh, this week uh, about a group, uh, a movement that I had been, uh, been I've been asked about quite a bit, and I it got to the point where I said there was enough interest that I started to look into it myself. Like I said, I dig into stuff and try to find out at the root level what what things are, and it's it's. Basically, uh, it's something called the Q. And I've been asked, do you believe the Q? Do you know who the Q is? And, and all this other stuff. And, and I started to look into it. And I tweeted out the other day something about it. And, and I know there's something there for this reason. The amount of anger and the hate that came from Twitter, that came from uh, Facebook, back towards me, just for asking a simple question. I said, listen, I played a video. I said, I, you know, I'm wondering... Uh, I've been looking into this, and I think this video is pretty fascinating. It's a video that kind of summarizes, or summarizes kind of where Q is right now. But it's a group of people that are very Christian-focused group of people who believe the deep state is real, which I don't think we can deny anymore that the deep state exists. But uh, I want you to go to YouTube, and I want you to search for Q for Beginners Part 1. Who is Q? And there's a gentleman whose handle is Praying Medic. And it's a four-minute, 50-second video that basically kind of lays out what Q is. And if you want to find out about its impact, just tweet something about it or social media. Watch the level of anger that comes back at you. And that, to me, uh, in and of itself, says that there's something there. But I've been looking into it. Uh, I'm going to continue to look into it. Anyway, thanks again to James Hellingpole. Thanks again to Ken Kukowski. Thanks again to President Trump. 
and the unhook, unhinged left for being exactly what we thought they were. Uh, you guys have a wonderful day. God bless. Judge Jeannie tomorrow.